Welcome to another episode of Laugh, Lend and Eat, the podcast, hosted by Fabi Nagni. Fabi is the National Sales Manager for First Option Mortgage and a featured writer for multiple mortgage magazines. Today's guest is the CEO, founder of MBS Highway, as well as Amazon's number one best-selling author, Barry Habib. With the release of Barry's new book, Money in the Streets, Barry sat down with Fabi and shared his insights about his new book and how the book will benefit anyone who reads it. We couldn't have Barry on the show without asking him to share his 2021 mortgage market forecast. So sit back and enjoy. All right. Welcome back to another edition of Laugh, Lend, and Eat the Podcast. And uh, this is a very special day today for me. I am honored and uh, blessed to introduce to our listening audience an American entrepreneur, friend to all in the mortgage industry, and now Amazon's number one best-selling author for his new book, Money in the Streets, Mr. Barry Habib. How are you, Bear? So great to be with you, Fabi. Always a pleasure to be with you and a privilege. Oh, man, I really appreciate that. It, uh, you know, for me, having you on the show is a, uh, like I said, it's a blessing for me, quite honestly. Um, I don't know if Nicole told you what happened in February. Did she ever tell you what happened in February on our first event? Tell us. So 20 some odd episodes ago, <laughs> this is the first time I'm actually apologizing to someone that's appearing on our show, right? Is I never hit the record button. So that last time you were here in February, it was supposed to be my first show ever for the podcast. We had a great one-on-one you and I did. <laughs> and I was terrified. I didn't know how to tell it to you. So I called Nicole and she said, don't worry about it. He, he's, this is not the first time it's happened to him. <laughs> oh, you know what, Bobby? Um, it, it, it's just like the book Money in the Streets. When, when bad things happen, it makes for other opportunities. That just makes this one even better. So I think it was, it was because perhaps the timing would have been even better to do this one. So it, it was fortuitous that it happened. Actually, that's a good, great point. I appreciate that. And once again, you know, I do apologize for that. That was such a blunder, but I was, uh, I didn't know how to work all this stuff then. Um, hopefully I got a little better today. We got, we have what's called the berry button now. It's this big red button that I hit before every show starts. And uh, it's actually work wonders. It's, it's recorded every episode <laughs> after that. <laughs> so anyway, Barry, listen, I got to start off with this, right? This is like, I know we're going to get into different things here as quickly as possible, but a year ago in September in Tampa, Florida, you predicted the mortgage market precisely. I mean, right in front of my face, about 16 feet away at that vision summit, you talked about the recession, you talked about where the bond was going to go. Obviously, no one knew the coronavirus, right? So that's obviously a very... Uh, a yeah, but those, those, those forecasts were all, they came to be before coronavirus was, was anything here in the U.S. That happened... Every, all the predictions came through in January right. and early February. So it was before Corona was here. And I'd started doing that uh, in early 2019, just based upon all the indicators we were looking at, even though everybody was forecasting rates to go up and 10 year treasury was like 2.8%. I said, it's going to one. And here's why. And kind of outlined everything and outlined the housing market. I've been right on the housing market for a long time, even though people have been poo pooing it. And, and all of it came to be just because of some good methodologies and indications, and we continue to look at those, and they've served me well through many, many years of being a forecaster. And I think that the way that things had panned out, obviously, it even got exacerbated after Corona. Mm -hmm. But when you take a look at when things become more normal, God willing, those trends are going to continue. Look, the housing market's going to stay really strong. And interest rates, I know while everybody right now is thinking interest rates are going to go up, and this and that, I don't agree. I've said recently that I think there's a little bit of inflationary pressure because there's more demand than there is supply with everybody getting unemployment sure. assistance. So there could be some inflation could cause rates to maybe move up a little bit. And we do have to be careful of that. And we are we have been monitoring that and advising people correctly. We've been ahead of it. However, next year when things come back to normal, while everybody else is forecasting rates to go up, we disagree. I think that rates will go down. I don't know if they get down to the lowest levels. But after rates go up next year, we think the amount of debt that this country is in, while most people think it causes rates to go up, it doesn't. It's the opposite. Mm -hmm. It causes rates to go down. And we're going from 22 to 29 trillion in debt. You know, trillions a lot of money. If you took a million dollars a day and tried to spend it, it would take you 2,700 years to spend a trillion dollars. Which is just, you know, and here you have 29 trillion dollars in debt and rising. 
that's going to act as a weight on the economy, a weight on growth, and as a consequence, a weight on inflation and interest rates when things get more normal. I can't tell you when that will be. You know, with, with, when's the virus? How effective is it? Sure. How many people decide to take it. You know, the, the, uh, when's a vaccine? And vaccine, yeah. vaccine. How many people take it? How effective is it? All these are going to play a part in this. And when we do see things feeling more like they did in 2019, we will be in the same set of circumstances to push rates down. Now, meanwhile, the housing market is seeing much more demand than there is supply. Mm -hmm. That's going to continue. It's going to persist. We're going to see home prices continue to go up. Right now, people are, uh, if they can purchase a home today, don't sit, don't wait, do it because you will make a lot of money from that purchase. But one thing I want to talk about, and you, you made, I, I took some notes real quick, but one thing I want to ask is you had mentioned a recession last year, right? I know that yeah. recession is here. Are we now coming out of that recession period? Yeah, we're yeah we're we're, we're right. definitely coming yeah we're definitely coming out of the recession. We're not going to have another shutdown, and I I, I don't know if there's going to be a second wave it's starting to happen in Europe right now. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of wild cards out there. There's a lot of uncertainty, and the election is another uncertainty too. Sure. Um, you know, right now it looks as if Biden has a has a reasonable lead, but look, similar predictions were made in 2016 mm -hmm. for. Uh, Hillary Clinton. So we'll know when we know, and we will know that if Biden does win and if uh, the Democrats gain control of both the House and the Senate, then it will be easier for them to pass a tax plan that they've already put forth that has me concerned. Uh, I'm not trying to get political here. I'm, I'm just saying that yeah. you know, we just opened history books and we looked after the Great Recession in the 1930s. It turned into the Great Depression because they raised taxes significantly. And it seems like a page out of that playbook. And I am worried about that. So that's got me concerned. I just hope that people just, whoever wins, first of all, I pray for a smooth transition to power. Mm -hmm. That's what I pray for, number one. Number two, whoever wins, pay attention to history. Because if we fail to pay attention to history, then as the saying goes, we're destined to repeat it. And we certainly do not want those bad things to happen. I just pray and hope that but uh, there's smart people who wake up and say, look at this playbook. It does not seem to have had a good history. Perhaps we should just consider a different path. That's what I hope for. Yeah. And, you know, because, I mean, look, I mean, we are in a political climate right now. I'm actually on the border of D.C. I'm like 20 minutes south of, of D.C., right? So to me, it's always my entire life has been nothing but political around here. We can't help but talk about it. The impact it has on the mortgage industry is so, I mean, it's so like we go head on with politics now, it feels like, because it feels like if there's a Democrat, then all of a sudden things are going to get tight and regulation, regulation will come back in. And if the Republicans stay, then regulations stay loose. I don't know exactly how much of an impact it has on the rates, but on a regulatory. So, so Bobby, I wouldn't but by any stretch of the imagination say regulations are loose. OK, I think I don't think that we're anywhere near loose, loose, loose regulation. <laughs> OK, we are a highly regulated industry. So regulations are extremely tight. Would they go tighter still? Potentially, I don't see what that would serve. Okay, that doesn't right. appear to make sense to me. Now, in addition to that, when we take a look at, you know, if, if we were to be in a position aside from, from tax consequences, one of the big things that is talked about in Biden's plan is what appears on the surface to be something that could be good, a tax credit. Once again, all I say is, please look at the playbook. When we tried this approximately eight years ago, it appeared to have an ephemeral effect where instantly had us, but then it didn't really do anything. All it did was bring purchases that would have happened, made them happen sooner because of the tax credit. So it left a lull afterwards. And we're already in a tight inventory place. So I think it could be, it could be something that maybe has an effect that sounds good. Mm -hmm. But once you think it through, in a tight inventory environment, bringing more buyers in, in a rush situation, will cause prices to rise. People will pay more for the home. Yes, they get the tax credit, but they'll probably exhaust it in the amount that they pay more. And then prices will more than likely, as they did eight years ago, see that lull and see the softening in the market because you've taken all those, those purchases that would have happened anyway, and you forced them forward, creating a spike with a subsequent lull and those people will wind up getting hung out to dry a little bit. Now I think like the artificial spike like you're saying. Yeah, the housing market is going to be strong enough to kind of level out over time, mm -hmm. but I think it will be a lot of angst with 
zero net result. In fact, I think it'll be a net minus result. So everybody's going, oh yeah, it's great. Sounds good, it sounds good. But people need to think about what the consequences could be because there's always unintended consequences. And people also need to think about, do we have a history for this? Have we seen it in action before? Fortunately we do. Let's please not make the exact same mistake that was made just a short eight years ago. Yeah. Do you see pockets of our country losing population due to the first time home buyers not being able to purchase homes? Um, I, I don't think so. No, I think that those are due to, um, due to taxes. Really? I think that, yeah. I mean, you see the migration is going out of high tax states into low tax states it's happening everywhere. That's, that's just factual. You, you want to quit. You want a great site. You all puts out data on where people are. How much does it cost for a U-Haul truck? You know, really? From, from New Jersey to Florida, it's expensive. From Florida to New Jersey, it's like dirt cheap. <laughs> from, from California to Las Vegas or to anywhere in Nevada, it's very, very expensive. Las Vegas or anywhere in Nevada to California is very, very cheap. This will tell you all you need to know about migration. Nobody looks at these simple things. Barry, where do you come up with all these metrics, man? Every time I hear you, you give me some new metrics to look at. It's amazing. Bobby, it's, it's, it, all it is is just common sense. All it is is if you want to find out where people are moving to, look at a company that does moving. Interesting, interesting. So where do you see, like, right now, as far as the mortgage market and the volume is cons that we've been dealing with, right? Record volumes, and I'm almost tired of everybody talking about record volume. Record, It's like, okay, I get it enough already. Is the volume going to stay as high or has it come, come down in 2021? What do you think? So right now, 70%, almost 70% of all loans are beneath 4.5%. And there's probably loans that are above 4.5% for a reason. Maybe credit quality of some sort precludes them from refinancing. So you have to figure that, you know, if rates were to go to, let's say, three and three quarters, which would now mean that if you're at four and a half or four and three eighths or four percent, you probably aren't as incented to refinance. You'll probably take out 80 to 85 percent of the refinances that are out there. Now, can they go to three and three quarters? There can be spikes that would see that. So people have to be prepared and be focused on the purchase market. So volume can change quickly. Um, I think that we're in a favorable interest rate environment, but because I see some inflation on the short term horizon, we could have some bumps along the way. Now, 2021 will be an interesting year because as we begin the year, we're still going to be, you know, mask people. But when we start to be able to take off the mask, which I hope to God is towards the second half of 2021 because mm. of wide adoption of a proven and effective and safe vaccine, that that will start to feel more normal. And that's when you'll start to see interest rates heading lower. So you will probably be in a good environment. But uh, it's going to be a bumpy road. And then again, the election is going to be another variable that will cause some, some waves there. And here's the other thing. Look, if you're in the mortgage business, you got a client that's on the fence or that's lackadaisical about getting their documents. And you have to tell them that, look, God willing, we get really good news that the vaccine comes out. Stock market's going to go up, but rates will go up. Bond prices are going to get hit. And it can happen like that. So you don't want to be on the sidelines because when the train leaves the station, it's going to be hard for you to jump on board because it's going to be a fast moving train. So get off the fence, get off your rear end, get into application, and then don't mess around, get your documents in to ensure a good result. Any customer who's out there, they have to realize what the opportunity is. It's a gift. It's a present. It's not like they worked hard to get the low rate, which will give them an extra thousand dollars a year every year for free. This is a gift. Either take advantage of it or you're going to lose it. This is not the time to mess around. Yeah, I've had I've actually had clients actually ask me. I don't I haven't originated in six years. And I just decided to figure out just to, just to try out the technology. And I actually had borrowers asking me, "Hey, will the rate get lower?" I'm like, "You're getting two point two five percent on a fifth on a VA thirty. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> I don't know how much it's, lower it's, you want. It's a bit silly. It's a bit silly. Yeah, let's dive into your book, Bear. I mean, it's coming out next Tuesday, I believe, the twenty seventh, right? Yeah, we've got some. We got there's some advanced copies, and as, as you were kind enough to say, I mean, what was really amazing is that it made literally number one on Amazon's bestseller list. Um, I saw that come out. My editor sent it to me on Saturday. I was like, wait a minute, you, what, you, you joking with me or no? So, uh, <laughs> but no, it's got some really good reviews to it. You know, Tony Robbins wrote a huge review. Randy Zuckerberg, you know, who written Ben in Facebook Live, she wrote a beautiful piece in it. And awesome. um, it, it's, it's, um, it will really help people. It'll help you see opportunities. It'll help you get through a tough time. It'll help you maximize a good time. Um, there's a lot in the book that are lessons that you can take to, to really improve your life, gain fulfillment, be happier. 
um, reach goals, see life differently. You know, people um, people just need to shift focus and mindset. It really will help you with that. And it's written so easily and plainly. I'm not looking to try and impress anybody. You know, and it, and it's very candid. Talk about a lot of mistakes of mine, things I screwed up on, and lessons that I've learned from it. And it talks a lot about optimism and how to keep that mindset and, and, and things that will things that will get in touch with your why. What which is made very you, what made you write a book? What, what was that like thought in your head? Like when you were thinking about, hey, I should write a book. I mean, was it a few years? Was it instant? Was it No, so Fabi, I've been thinking about it for a long time and I didn't want to write a mortgage book. You know, I, I don't want to write a mortgage book. I, I wanted to write a life book. And um, there's so many lessons that I've learned, so many mistakes that I've made, so many opportunities that I've seen and had, and, and things that I did that, you know, I would talk to people and teach people about and work with people about, and it would make an impact on them, and I would see them flourish. And I've coached a lot of people, many of them in our industry who become coaches, speakers, I mean, so, 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 so many that I've touched and helped, and I see what they do for others. So yeah, um, that kind of said okay listen i think that this is something that i need to do but it's we're well, writing books pain in the ass man it's a, and, and especially if you're me i didn't know no ghost writer no the, the, i had to do every single word because I'm, wow. I'm a perfectionist you know so i wasn't going to just mail it in because it's got my name on it and anything that i put my name on it's got to be up to my standards i'm i'm, I'm, I'm a big pain in the ass got anybody who's <laughs> working about, about that's interesting you say that because sue Woodard was on the show a few weeks ago and she gave you props for uh, getting her on on the speaking circuit. Oh, I teach. I taught her how to become a speaker. She, poor, yeah. the, poor, the poor girl, had to tolerate me, you know, <laughs> making her cry so many times, like I do everybody, because I cared about her so much that I wasn't going to let her go out there unless I knew that she was able to do it the right way. And obviously, she's become so successful and helped so many people. But there's been a lot of people like that in the industry. You know, you take a look at. Uh, so many speakers that that I've helped and touched, mm -hmm. and, and you know Tim Brahim and, uh, and and Megan Anderson. The, the list goes on and on and on. You know, look look at Cindy Ertman and right. all of these great people in our industry that have this great ability. That in some small part I was able to work with and help. Um, this is something that I wanted to kind of put these lessons in a book. Not just if you want to be a speaker, but just if you want to succeed in anything or improve yourself. Um, there's so many lessons that I've learned that are translated in very easy to understand ways on how to improve your life. You know, I've had a lot of hardships. I've made a lot of mistakes and enduring those uh, and coming out of those means that anybody could come out of them or enjoy them. Well, that, that's interesting because that's one of the lines that actually caught me in, in, in your summary, I guess is the best way to say it is that the line went, no matter the struggle, whether self-doubt, negativity, loss, stress, or being stuck in life, Money in the streets is a resolution roadmap. It is. And it really starts with focus, Bobby. You know, it, it starts with what you look at. You know, if, if you follow negativity, if you just look and think small, that's the world that you will be in. Hmm. So, you know, Bobby, I like cars. I like, uh, I like, you know, sports cars. I like to drive on the track, but I also like to do things right. So that means for me, trying to be the best version of myself and, that means taking lessons from people that are far superior. So I've had a lot of professional lessons on the racetrack. And one of the best lessons I learned was focus. And it's so true on the track, but it's even more important in life. Most people drive, you'll catch, people will catch you. If you listen to this, you catch yourself. When you drive, you'll see on the road that you tend to focus on the car in front of you. That's just the normal way to look on the road for most people. But the real way to drive, if you learn from a professional driver is to look way down the road. And here's mm. a great example, Bobby. If you take a bottle of water, this lesson is in the book. Mm -hmm. Take a bottle of water, put it about 20 feet in front of you on the ground in front of you. And I want you to then be outside, look at the bottle of water, be where on the street somewhere or on the sidewalk. And then try and focus on the bottle of water and look down the road and see if you could read the sign. You can't. Yeah. But look at the sign, read the sign. I bet you could see the bottle of water. <laughs> if you learn how to do this one simple thing, you will be so much of a better driver, so much of a safer driver, so much better at avoiding things that will come out of you because you'll see them. So you'll be a better driver. But if you do this in life, you'll become far more successful.
Because if you take your focus off here, if you focus on the big picture, if you try to remove points of friction, which we talk about in detail, mm -hmm. you try to do things on a much wider scale, you'll still have this, but now all this becomes open to you. How so does it's somebody, a very important lesson. How does somebody take that lesson, Barry? I mean, you, that's an amazing lesson right there, right? And how do they execute on that in their life? If they're, let's say a loan officer right now, right? And they're doing, you know, maybe seven, eight units a month, which is pretty decent, right? How do they take that lesson and, and really just absorb it and say, I'm going to make this change because I heard it. I believe it. I think it can work for me. So are you maximizing the time that we're granted? We can't really manage time. We just got to try and maximize the time that we're given to be most effective. So are you doing that? Are you using leverage in everything you do? Are you maximizing the time that you have by doing things that will put your leads on autopilot? Are you building a following on social media? Are you investing in yourself and getting yourself trained so that you now have something to offer to the masses so people know you're the best? Are you creating things that anticipate questions so you don't have to go through them with every customer because you've got them automated mm -hmm. and then you can do them? Or is your follow-up system automated? Are you only being there for the high touch points so that you can have the most leverage in every single thing you do? Have you gone through training that makes you most effective so that if I'm talking to a customer, my chance of converting them is extraordinarily high, regardless if I have the best rate or not? Or are you just out there fighting with headset jockeys and are you transactional and are you selling instead of advising? See, that's how you take those lessons. If you're selling, if you're just focused on your own little world. If you're not growing, you know, if you're not using social media, if you're not creating a following in an audience like you are, Bobby, if you're not, you know, doing those things, then your focus is here. Yeah. But if you're doing things like you're doing, Bobby, with your great podcast and helping people, if you've gone through trainings, if you are a certified mortgage advisor, if you put yourself into a position where you can make a difference. If you have everything automated, scripts automated, so that you don't have to answer the questions, you're answering questions before they're asked. You're following up without it being something that you have to do. Then you're thinking like this. Mm. And that allows you to maintain a great business here, but now you can do so much more of it. Yeah. I, I mean, you, know, you just asked me and I just rattled I off. You know, that. So, so I, that's, that's on the spot answer. I'm sure if we thought through it, Bobby, we could think of so, so much more. Barry, what I'm getting at is I hope the people who are listening, you know, the seven, seven, eight people that listen to our podcast every week. I'm just kidding about that, by the way. <laughs> I just hope that they really understand. You just, you just broke it down perfectly to where they could actually just execute that if they're a loan officer, if whatever, wherever they are in life. You know what I mean? It's, well, that's what the book tries to do, Bobby. The book just tries to be very easy, very simple, very common sense and help you get to the next level, help you. The first thing we have to do with the opportunity is see it. Hmm. Bobby, there's an art form to seeing it. And that's what we try and teach is how to see the opportunity. And then once you see it, trust your gut, trust your gut on how to do it. So you have to see vision is important. You have to then once you've seen it, then take action on it and you have to be optimistic. Yeah, you know, yeah. it, it, all successful people have a common quality and that's optimism, all of them. You know, and you have to be willing to take some risks. You have to be able to evaluate those risks. Mm -hmm. These are all things that are part of the recipe. You know, How did the name Money in the Streets come about? The name Money in the Streets came from like so many immigrants come to the U.S. And what happens is, is that they hear about America being such a rich country. Now, my parents, my ancestry is from Spain. And my family lived in Turkey for many years, or many generations, I should mm -hmm. say. We were not Turkish, we were Spanish. It was the first language I learned. And what happened when my parents came here is they heard the story like all immigrants here at America, what a rich country, there's money in the streets, all you have to do is pick it up. And obviously when they got here, you know, uh, the government in Turkey took everything they had and they had nothing, two kids. And my dad was older, my dad was 57, my mom was 40. And they come to the US and they, uh, they discover that uh, there wasn't so much money in the streets out there. My mom worked in a sweatshop. My dad had to humble himself and work at a hot dog stand. Mm. And we were very poor. And then they found out that, that I was going to be on the way. <laughs> and uh, when they found that out, Bobby, then, uh, you know, it was fortunate because I was conceived uh, right before birth control became available. So I snuck in there. And then on top of it, they would have had an abortion, but 
uh, abortion was not yet legal. I was pre Roe Wade, so I kind of threaded the needle in there, Bobby. You know, so it's kind of fortunate. <laughs> but, uh, I'm, I'm like on bonus time here, right? So I want to make the most of it. Um, but you know, listen, I never focused on the fact that even before I was born, that you know, I really wasn't something that was planned or even wanted, because that's what most of us have to understand. Being born is the most random event you will ever have in your life. Mm. Random thing. And when you think about randomness in general. We didn't pick the family. We didn't pick the year. We could have been born 500 years ago, 500 years in the future, rich family, poor family, happy family. And their problems and circumstances instantly become ours. When yeah. we're born. So it's very random. And the fact that my parents didn't plan for me, didn't really want to have a kid. I don't blame them. That was 57 and poor working to hot dogs. And my mom was working in a sweatshop, making dresses. They couldn't even make ends meet. And now a new baby on the way at their advanced age. They didn't even speak English. So, of course, I don't blame them for that. And that's the thing about rejection. We all have to understand that we will get rejected, but rejection isn't about you. Rejection is about the circumstances. Mm. Don't make it about you. Because if you do, then you have self-doubt. It's not you. It's the circumstances when someone else rejects you. So my mom would tell me these stories. My dad, unfortunately, passed away when I was a young kid, when I was a young kid and I had to kind of grow up quick. And that made it very difficult for us. But my mom would tell me stories about how, you know, we were struggling when we came, when they came to America, they thought it was such a rich country and they didn't exactly find the abundance everybody was talking about. Mm. And she would say it kind of half laughing, but it was also sad. And as, as Fabi, as I began to see opportunities that existed, as I began to then take action, and understand how to make things happen. I remember sitting down with my mom before she passed away and holding her hand and saying, you know, mom, you were right. There really is money in the streets. Wow. And all you have to do is be able to see it first and then know how to pick it up and then do good with it. Wow. And um, I was very glad I had that conversation with her because there truly is Bobby. So the name of the book is really just a, an honor of my parents and everyone who's come to America to want to see the opportunities that are here because there are, they're everywhere. We just have to get in touch with them. And then once we see them, be able to act on them. And once we act on them, then just do good with it. Barry, you're, you're hey, you're an amazing guy, right? I mean, I, I've, I've been in, I mean, I, look, dude, I'm going to flatter you a little bit. Just get over it. I'm going to do it. But I've been in all of you since I saw you first in 2002, right? You just, I mean, it was like, I saw you speaking at this convention and it just like, boom. And then ever since I've heard you, I've gotten to know you now. But you have this uncanny ability to just see things that other people don't see. I don't know if you know that or not, or you've been told that or not, but it sounds like you just see things in a different way than the rest of us do. Have you been, is that, I mean, I'm, yeah. Well, I think we all have the ability, Bobby. I, I, I think that maybe that I've tried to become more in tune with it, but I think every single one of you have that ability. You know, it's just thinking a little bit in advance, we tend to look at the surface. Remember, I started this whole thing with vision, right? So mm -hmm. if we stop focusing here and we start focusing here, things start to unwind and then trust your gut, Father. You know, I talk about it in the book. The lesson I learned to trust my gut was when I was a little boy and, um, and my dad had a heart attack and family went to visit him in the hospital. And, you know, he seemed okay. You know, maybe I was just a young kid. I don't, I don't know. Maybe a heart attack wasn't that bad. He seemed okay. So as we left the hospital room to leave and we were by the elevator and we pressed the button for the elevator and, and something in my gut said, you have to go back. We all get these feelings, Bobby. And I, instead of saying, well, you know, well, okay, I've got to go. I mean, I'm just, I was just 11 years old and on my own, I just told my family, sorry, I'll be right back. Yeah. So I took off and ran down the hall as fast as I could and went back to my dad's room. And as I saw him laying there, I made sure that I said goodbye, dad, and I love you. Yeah. And I'm glad I did, Father, because this is the last time I saw him. Wow. And a lesson I learned was to, to trust your gut. And I've kept that with me all the time so you know if you could see things and then if you can see points of friction if you could trust your gut we we can be our own worst enemy by seeing all these things and we'd say to ourselves later on, oh i knew it or i should have don't do that to yourself if you 
feel it in your gut. If you feel something's really good, or if you feel something's wrong, how many times have we screwed up because we knew something was wrong and we said, oh, no, it's okay. Get in touch with that. So right. that's the first thing. And you know, you, you start every day with gratitude, man. Just, just uh, I do every day. You know, I, I literally say out loud after my cup of coffee, all the things that I am grateful for, because what happens is, is that invariably you're going to have things that will be. Yeah. Difficult. You know, last time we were talking, I was talking about my meditation practice and how it's been helping me a lot. The three things that I focus on nowadays, right? The three things that this has really been life-saving for me is non-judgmental acceptance and gratitude. And, as, and, I, and I'm like, don't be a nag. <laughs> That's my little acronym, right? Be non-judgmental, be accepting and be, be grateful. And man, I mean, it's like the world just started changing. And I was like, hold on, Fab, the world's not changing. My perception is changing. The world is still the same. The world doesn't change just because I changed. Um, you change I, your mind, you change the world, brother. Yeah, yeah. I learned that you know how to fly now, right? Or you took flying lessons or? I did, I, I did. I, I was all, all into this crazy stuff, you know, just, uh, yeah. So I took fly, I took lessons, uh, learned a lot about, you know, the whole Bernoulli principle and how to fly little, you know, 152s and 170 Cessnas. And, and uh, yeah, I kind of liked it. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, but, um, but I'll tell you something, I, I, I stopped because I had a couple of situations where, um, I had a couple of situations where I got uncomfortable because the weather changed and this and that. And I was like, you know, maybe, maybe uh, this is not something I should really be spending a lot of time doing. Uh, and, you know, as it turned out, you know, fortunate circumstances just, just happen. The universe puts stuff together for, you, you know, I'm very spiritual. So, so I, I guess I, I knew that I, the universe knew I was into this and I wanted to make it a friend who's actually a instructor for pilots. He took me in this $11 million flight simulator. Whoa. And, you know, I get in this thing and this is where pilots go to get recertified. So he sneaks me into this. And when you're in there, there's all these other people there and you're taking notes. So I guess they all thought I was a pilot. So the first time I take a 737 simulation, I fly it around, I landed perfect and it was great. I was like, wow, man, the next one I take up and I fly it around and I crash on the landing. Everybody in there, you're not supposed to do that. Everybody in there picked their head up and like, who is this guy? Bobby, I did it again. I crashed again. Everybody was like, wait a second. I was like, hold on. I'm not really a pilot. Don't worry. <laughs> They're like, I want to see who this guy is because if he's flying a plane, I'm out. Uh, but um, but yeah, it was a lot of fun, man. I do like, I do enjoy things like that. I love to learn, Bobby. I love to learn things. Yeah, there was a there was a, a, a guy that I was talking with one time. We were talking about turning our life and our will over to God or to the universe, or whatever you want to call about, right? And I said to him, I said, it's interesting when you when you really dive deep into that topic, right? We want to question God, the existence, is this going to happen? I said, but man, I get on a plane. I never talk to the pilot. This guy's taking me 35,000 feet into the sky. I don't know where he was the night before, two hours before. I get, right? Well, but Bobby, I, I'm very, very spiritual, I, I, as you are too. And, uh, you know, I believe in the power of prayer. I, I believe in God. I, I, I. I think that there is so much there that we get glimpses of and we could kind of feel and to doubt it, the, the best analogy that I have thought of to this, because I wanted to try and explain this to people mm -hmm. the best that I could is like this. I had this dog, Jordan was my golden retriever and people would say the smartest dog they ever saw. I mean, this dog was a blessing. All I want to do is make you happy. This dog was like half human. I could talk to this dog. He probably he knew what I was saying. You know, it, it, just a brilliant dog. However smart he was, or any dog, if I showed that dog an Excel spreadsheet, he's not going to be able to understand it. Mm. Doesn't mean the dog's not brilliant or smart. And it doesn't mean the Excel spreadsheet doesn't exist. Just because we don't understand something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Yeah. So we get glimpses of it. So just think about that. Yeah. We're all made up of star stuff, brother. Yeah, yeah. No, the, this one guy said to me, he said, the only thing you need to know about God is you're not it. Yeah. Move on. You, go. you, <laughs> you know what I mean? Keep it as simple as possible and move the hell on, Fab. You know what I mean? Because the more you try to understand this, the, the I, quite honestly, look, I mean, I, I'll never understand it. I got a few more minutes with you. I'm going to run through these topics because you're the one who put this guy's name in my head and I've been having nightmares about him. Richard Barton, <laughs> former CEO of, of, of Expedia. 
now running Zillow. I found this very interesting thing from the, I think it was the International Travel Association, where they were happy that they were at 24% of online travel bookings were being used through them. And I, my head said that means there's 76% that Expedia and a bunch of other companies have taken, not the traditional travel agents, right? I, 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 I'm shocked that 24% of traditional travel agents, Bobby, they're almost extinct right now. Yeah, I think it was more corporate. And okay, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Specific tours, like if you want to yeah. go to Egypt or something like that, right? Um, Richard Barton is now at Zillow, as we all know, or if you don't know, you should know. <laughs> and I yeah, know so I mean, he's come around and told the shareholders he wants to put mortgage professionals out of business. He thinks that there's no need for him. He just wants to automate everything to the point where it's a commodity. But the, the big mistake there is it's not. And mortgage professionals who don't take the step up are right now believing their own press clippings because right now times are fat, but it doesn't always last that way. Take it for somebody who's been doing this 35 years, originated for 21. I've had tailwinds before. Mm -hmm. I stayed grounded. I did not believe my own press clippings. I use these times to get better because the change is coming. You want to be really good, see the future before it becomes obvious. Okay. I'm telling you what the future is. The future is, is this is not going to last forever. And the way to plan for the future is not when it's already happened, when you're behind, plan for it today. And I don't want to hear, I don't have time, I'm too busy. Get better. Right. There are ways to get better. Excuses are excuses. Get results, don't get excuses. Plan for the future today. Simple. Where does technology fit into this, Bear? I know you mentioned that real quick. Master it. Master it. Learn it. Understand it. Master it and use it. Because otherwise it becomes your enemy. Yeah, because it seems like more and more loan officers are A, adapting to it. But then there's a cluster of loan officers that's like, I don't need to learn it. I'm too busy to learn it. You know what that's, I mean? That, my class is all referral. That, that, that's, that's, not a, that's not a good decision in my opinion. And I don't think, I, you know what? It's not even my opinion. Factually, it's not a good decision. Yeah. You, you know, I don't want to learn. I mean, think about just all you have to do is just listen to that. Let that sit in. I don't want to learn. Right. Yeah. Okay. So if I am going to give the most important financial transaction in my life to you and you're a person who doesn't want to learn, I don't want to give that transaction to you. I want to give it to somebody who's always learning, who's always improving, who's always got my best interest in mind because the world changes. Yeah. And with coaching, it seems like mortgage guys seem to think after three, four years of being in the business, they don't need coaches. I know you love sports. You're a big sports guy also, right? Huge. And, and athletes have coaches for the entire duration of their career. Bobby, I have coaches. I've got coaches. Okay. I've got yeah. coaches in every area. I've got coaches for my medical stuff, okay, that work with me. I've got coaches that train me. I've got a coach for meditation. Okay. I've got coaches. I look at people. I've got coaches on the financial market. I do. Wow. I have mentors and I have coaches. I never stop learning. I never stop learning. Um, Saturday, I'm going to spend with Tony Robbins. Tony and I, he's become a good friend. He's a coach. He's a mentor. Uh, next week, I'm going to Puerto Rico to go spend time with John Walden. John Walden is brilliant. Lacey Hunt and I spend time on the phone all the time. Peter Bookbar, David Rosa. I spent uh, Ivy Zellman. The list goes on and on of all my coaches. I mean, now, Sometimes I act as a coach to a lot of these people too, where my area of expertise, I've got a great coach for nutrition. I've got a great coach, as I mentioned, for meditation. I've got a great coach and a trainer for my workouts. I've got tons of coaches. I, I'm one thing I pride myself on is being coachable. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the only way I'm learning and growing because I don't have all the answers. I'm not stupid enough to think I've got all the answers. I know it all. I, I am. I'm learning every single day and all my mistakes and all my flaws and all my shortcomings that I want to try and get better at. I'm, I'm a student. I'm not, I'm, I'm a student. Yeah. You, your tone has changed in the way you speak. I don't know if you know that about you. I hear I'm a musician, right? So I'm sorry. I got to hear tones. Right. And it sounds I'm, like I'm a musician too, but I sing. I don't play an instrument, but I sing. <laughs> and it sounds like you're 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 like all of a sudden like you're growing leaps and bounds, man. I mean, you're 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 on a different journey. It feels like what what is the next chapter in your? Is there a next chapter that you're already kind of seeing in your life already, Barry? So there's always always a next chapter. You know, I've been very blessed and very fortunate that I have a lot of things that have culminated just in the past month um, that have been things that I've been working on for a very long time that have culminated. So I've been very grateful and very blessed. Um, but you know, Fabi, I, I, um, I think that, um, 
you know, about eight years ago when I found out I had cancer, that really was kind of a, a redefining moment for me and uh, really kind of looking at things just a lot differently. Mm -hmm. And going through that whole thing was, uh, you know, I kept it very, very private. I only talk about it now because it's in the book, mm -hmm. but I never even mentioned it. Never mentioned it from the stage, never talked about it to anybody because I didn't want to be like, oh, poor guy, or this or take it easy on him or what. I didn't want that. But um, but it was definitely a um, a point of reflection that I think kind of helped me see things a little bit differently. So listen, I've always been very caring. I've always been a loving person. I've always been a kind person. I've always tried to be a teacher mm -hmm. to help people with things that I knew and a student to learn things that, that I don't know. Uh, but what's, what was very important about that is learning about the finite nature of things, you know, and uh, how quickly things can really, really change. And maybe it just gave me a little bit more appreciation and look at things a little bit differently. So uh, I thought I, I always tried to be a good person, uh, but I think that kind of just opened my eyes to some things that maybe I didn't see before. Yeah, those kind of moments do, do definitely, I mean, you know, there is a paradigm shift that occurs at that moment. And for most of us, if our eyes aren't open, we'll never see it. But most, you know, for some that can, the world is is, is totally beautiful at that moment. So. Barry, I want to thank you for your generosity with your time, uh, your insight as always. Uh, you you are an amazing person. I'm so, I'm, I swear to God, I, I mean this by the bottom of my heart. Bless to share this time with you. Um, you know, I got a one-on-one -on -one coaching session with you early in February. Hopefully this time the whole world gets to hear what you talked about. Uh, and uh, thank you once again for your time and coming on the show with us. Oh, Bobby, love you. Thank you so much. You're you're a good man, my friend. What a what a privilege to be with you. Thanks so much, brother. Have a good day. Okay. You too. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Laugh, Lend, and Eat the podcast. Once again, thank you to our sponsors, First Option Mortgage, and One Good One Staffing Services. We have enjoyed all the comments we have been receiving, please keep them coming. To be notified of any updates, please be sure to subscribe to Laugh, Lend and Eat on the listening platform of your choice. Thank you for listening and have a great day.